Okay, thank you. Really appreciate everyone joining. Uh, hopefully this will be uh, interesting and a fun conversation. Really cool stuff. Your feedback questions are very much welcome. And with that quick intro, let's get started. Kind of an interesting thing, as Nano mentioned, we have this uh, virtual jar and if one of us has an idea and anybody uses the phrase, we've, we've always done it, you know, this way, that's why we object to change. You have to put $10 in the jar and every couple of months, you know, we collect the money and go out to have a good time. So if somebody is thinking about this as an, an objection way and you can't defend the new idea with actual, uh, you know, science or experience or something like that, then I will, uh, I will suggest you use this as a, a tool in your company as well. But that's going to be the theme for today. So a lot of things we're going to talk about are way, way, way different. Some of them are just slightly different, right? This, uh, some of you might, you know, wiggle in your seat a little bit. Oh my God, I, so different than what we do. That's the point. New things, new results, new ideas. Okay. So what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about the general term is a factory in a box, right? That's what this is all about. So picture on the left, a standard PCB house, right? Whether this is your mom and pop shop down the road or any of the big fab houses, right? They look about the same like this. A lot of chemicals, a lot of people, a lot of stations, a lot of things that really none of us know how to use, we don't want to use, and we definitely don't want to suggest building this in-house. But on the other hand, a box about the size of a refrigerator that can do about 80% of the capability that we can get of the fab house and can do it extremely fast, that's, that's a different story. So that's what we're going to talk about. And in terms of what do you want or what can you get out of this conversation today or what can you get out of this uh, technology, if you don't remember anything we talk about, only remember this slide, we're going to give you two things, or additive technology in general gives you two things, incredible speed and flexibility. And I'll explain how we approach this from additive electronics. So a typical company, right, and, and I'm guilty of this as well, uh, a typical design cycle, first, we all are experienced by what we have as, as an internal process in our company, right? What it takes to actually get something done so we can have on our desk, so we can test it out. This will govern how we behave in all projects. Companies that are very slow because they have a lot of cumbersome activities, so the defense mechanism that the engineers would usually get is they over-design the prototypes, they make a significant amount of changes between revisions, so they can solve, hopefully solve multiple problems in a single revision. This leads, right, that's the picture on the right, this leads to a lot of work and then basically you're dead in the water until the prototype comes in and then again a lot of work, a lot of changes. If you have an additive capability, right, you can literally test a single, test or solve a single problem, a single idea every time and keep the project moving along and manage the risk and manage the changes a lot smoother. So for instance, if we were to design something uh, conventionally, we would do a final design, do a layout, do a design review, get something quoted multiple times until we get a board out. If we have an internal capability, we can do a schematic, do a general layout, put it on a on a test board, run it, test it, right? We know the schematic is good. Then we do the final layout or a suggestion of a layout, run it. We can do a mechanical sample for the uh, mechanical engineers that they can visually make sure everything has room, uh, you know, nothing touches, height clearances, things like that. Run a full board, test it, verify layout, right? Very small problems, very small increments, and we can solve that, right? So flexibility and time, those are the things that you may want to uh, remember from today if that's the only thing you remember from today. So we've gotten, let's move on from general ideas and conversation and let's, let's really understand how we do or how the technology works and allows you to do what you want to do. Uh, 
And at the end of it, right, what we all want, we all want the picture on the left, right? We want a prototype that can be completely done in-house very cheaply, very fast, so we can put something in the hands of management, right? We can make sure everything works, reduce risk, reduce time. We want to just move forward. We don't want to delay anything. So let's talk about what uh, our technology is all about and how it actually works. So we are ink-based technology, right? So we start with two materials uh, that are liquid form and they are really liquid. If you open our container, you know, flip it on its head, it will flow to the floor. True liquid materials that are jetted um, from two print heads at the same time and everything happens inside the system. So let's talk about what really happens inside the system. Each print head is about 500 nozzles uh, that, they, that the system knows how to work with, so we can jet material from one nozzle or all 500 of them, so the delivery of the material is very precise. The t technology in general, if you're interested, the, the heads are piezo heads, right? So they pulse, electrically pulse, and that's how we deposit the material. Next up, once we deposit a fine layer of material, could be a dielectric material, could be a conductive material, then we have three types of energy that come into play to make sure that instead of a liquid, we have a solid and everything is bonded and cured together. You can see in the picture there's a blue light, right? So that's a UV lamp. That cures the polymer, which is the dielectric material. After that, we have, you can see a, a strip of red light. That's IR light, right? So no lasers here. That fuses the conductive material. We use silver. So that fuses the silver particles and changes the state right from solid, from uh, liquid to solid. We actually suspend our, our silver particles in salt. So essentially it vaporizes the salts that suspend them in liquid and make them solid. Lastly, the print bed is also heated. That uh, ambient heat right, bonds the uh, polymer to the conductive material and makes sure that they uh, like to stay together and don't separate. So typical industry uh, kind of challenges of, you know, a phrase called delamination that happens on occasion with conventional PCBs just doesn't happen here because there's no lamination. Once it's all said and done, right, then it's rinse and repeat for as many slices, right? So we, we change the term from layers to slices. So as many slices as needed to build whatever we're building. Once that's all done, there's no secondary process. There's no drilling here. There's no plating here. There's no baking. There's no cleaning needed, right? When the part's done, Everything is going to be ready. The vias are going to be there. Your through holes are going to be there. Your pads are going to be there. Everything is done, and you don't need a secondary station to do anything. Any questions about this? Cool. Okay, so we understood how we deposit the material. Let's really talk about what these materials, uh, uh, what their capabilities, what do they do? So in terms of, I'm going to start from the top, in terms of our dielectric ink, uh, it essentially does everything a conventional FR4 will do. If you look at the table on the right, you kind of get an understanding that it goes beyond FR4. For the sake of this conversation, let's say everything, every capability you're used to doing with standard FR4, you can uh, achieve or exceed using our material. We deposit a very fine layer of material at a time, 2.5 microns at a time. So if we're thinking about how we do internal geometries, what kind of shapes we can do, uh, we know we, we have a very small building block, right? The ultimate Lego experience. So our Legos are very small, so we can do really fine features. Also, if we think about, you know, surface, fin surface finish uh, or surface effects for those of us that are interested in a little higher speed type design, we also get an understanding that this will perform very well. For those of us who don't care about high speed but have more of a industrial type applications, 
Uh, high voltage insulation is also something you get. By the way, this was measured at the minimum, uh, what we call minimum layer, right? So five slices, about 17 micron thickness, you already get 100 giga ohm of insulation at 500 volts. So we covered the dielectric, right? That's only half of, uh, half of the playing field. Let's talk about the conductor material. We use silver nanoparticles, and you can see that uh, we deposit, if we thought 2.5 microns at a time, now we deposit 0.35 microns at a time. So nine times finer in terms of uh, resolution. So when we think about how we, what type of geometries or what types of shapes we can make our traces uh, look like, we understand that here, right, we can do whatever we want and we don't have to go uh, in a straight line. Things can start to go spirally, things can go in angles. So we'll talk about all of these things, but really, you know, think of yourself as Picasso. You can, if you can draw it with your hands, that we can make it. There's no limitations on that. Uh, resistivity and conductivity, the material is very conductive, and so it's not conductive-like or it's not paste-like or anything like that. It is slightly less conductive than bulk copper, if you want to get into slightly on, on the physics of uh, why that happens. So in nature, silver is more conductive than copper, but because we're talking nanoparticles of uh, silver versus bulk copper, physics is slightly against us in the conductivity realm, so we're less conductive than copper. So usually that comes into play when we're talking about uh, high power applications or more specifically high current applications. There we, we have to uh, tread carefully and see what applications fit. For those of us that are in the either medical aerospace, you'd love the phrase downstairs or the phrase at the bottom, right? So we did invested a lot of time uh, 20,000 hours in a temperature chamber, right? And this is kind of two temperature chambers with a rail between them that it spends some time in negative 40, the rail moves to the plus 85, uh, 20,000 hours to test the uh, resistance change over time and over temperature. And the results showed that it stays within 2% of the desired resistance. Okay, so we understood how our system deposits the material, we understood what the materials are, but how do we interface, do we need to completely redesign everything, and so the answer is you don't. To show that point, we went to Texas Instruments website, uh, you can see the part number on the top, you can download all the files associated with this board, and we definitely did not design this board, we actually don't even know who designed this board, we just know that we got files from uh, TI, the files happen to be Gerber's with a good stack up description, right? What's layer one, what's layer two, thicknesses, things like that. All things that are standard in the way we design PCBs anyway. So we load it up to our system, we build the stack up from the bottom to the top, right? You can see signal layer one, signal layer two, layer three, layer four. We got some vias that go from one to four. So we need to adjust for those or tell the system how those go from what layer to what layer. Do we want them plated, unplated, things like that. Obviously, because it's a VIA, we want it filled. So all these uh, settings, we spend about five, ten minutes to set up this job. And a day later, right, it's on your desk. And so at this point, I'll beg your forgiveness for the uh, shoddy assembly job. I did this on my desk just to, to have this Kodak moment. And if you're you're keen or, or attentive to this, you'll see on the right you see silk screen, on the left you don't see silk screen, right? This is another cool hack to achieve even higher speeds, right? If we want the silk screen, we'll just print it. If we don't, then we remove it. It just gives us a faster print. And I'll show you some examples with and without. It's totally user's choice. Another little pet peeve that I used to have and I would hate, paneling. Right, if I'm thinking this is going to go to vendor A, they use this size panel, and so I panel it this way. If procurement then decides to take it to a different vendor that uses different panels or wants to change the paneling way, then immediately you get an email, hey, can you repanel this or can we repanel this? We'll charge you whatever 
extra. So forget all of that. Design it and one up. There's no need to panel. The system will tell you how many it can print, and if you want them multiples, they will print separated. There's no need for rescoring, all the things that we hate at the end uh, to do anyway. So ultimate freedom. At the okay. end, when we press on the job, it will tell us how long and how many materials it's going to consume. Go ahead. Hey, uh, so I was just wondering what the silk screen material is made out of. Is that just a uh, layer? Exactly. So great question. Yes. So there's only two materials in the system, either dielectric or conductive. We print the silk screen with silver. Uh, so yes, this will be uh, engraved in silver. So I'll show you. I'll show you how it looks in a couple of slides. Actually, the next slide. So to show we we don't favor just TI. So we downloaded a different application from Microchip and clicked order the board now and made one ourselves. And here you can see we printed the silk screen and built one. This is an aluminum board, right? So we printed our version of the aluminum board and. You can see it here running. This is slightly higher current uh, and higher power. This actually, you can see the blind lights, right? This is so bright, as LEDs, that it blinded my camera, and it shows those lines of light. It's so bright, can't really look at it when it just works. And if you're curious what the hell this is, uh, when we all go to the dentist, they have the fancy big LED light that they use to shine on our face, and then they have an adjustable lens to focus it so that only blinds or only shines in our mouth. That is what they use most likely. Uh, so very cool stuff. Uh, CATI will share my presentation if you guys want. So the YouTube link here is a five minute YouTube link just to give you an idea of what it takes to load up a job into the system. By the way, we consider this uh, a kind of like a McDonald's piece of equipment, right? The operator does not need to be the industry leader in whatever this is, right? So the operator does not need to be an expert in PCB manufacturing, does not need to be uh, an engineer, needs to know how to click a few buttons and load up the values of, the values of thicknesses that you guys, you the engineers, provided in the stack up. Right, so, uh, but it can be run by, right, it can be run by the engineers, right, so if you want to make it an R&D lab kind of a, a piece of equipment, if you have a center of excellence, right, that has a lot of stuff and the operators there are already staffed, or if this is going to be on the shop floor, right, wherever this would be, we can find an operator that, that can use this. Okay, so I was expecting some questions. Wait, how do we do everything? Do we do vias? Does this need to drill at the end? So everything is done internally, right? We, we build things additively. This slide talks about suggested design rules. All right, so the suggested design rules are there to make sure that whatever you design, the system will actually make reliably, consistently uh, over time. And I want to show you why we have those design rules. So for instance, on the bottom, you'll see these are perfect printed scenarios, right? These are, this is a system that's well maintained uh, and works well, and it prints very nice and clean, and you can see the surface finish is very nice. The top picture is actually a system, this, we, a system before we did uh, major maintenance on, this is how it's printed. So you can see there's a couple of, of sprays and dots and things like that that are not on the main area that we want. So if we think about how we deposit material kind of like a waterfall, then we understand that majority of the water will run down the water flow, but there's some that might splash on the side, right? And that's what we see here. We see what we call side splashes. So even in this worst case scenario, right, the top picture really is not a big compliment for us. But even at this worst case scenario that the system is not optimal, it still would pass the design rules, would still pass signal integrity because there's 99.9% .9 of the mass that of the material inside where it needs to go and only 0.1% of the mass outside. And so for that reason, right, this is, we did the math for you guys that if you maintain those design rules, then most likely you're going to get a good print. 
if you completely ignore our design rules and say, you know, I want to design something way beyond, the system is still going to attempt to do it. It's not going to reject it, but just know that you're venturing, right, when no people ventured before or maybe a few people and maybe dragons are ahead of you and just know that it's not guaranteed. Any questions? Beautiful. I was expecting some, uh, oh my God, wait, how many layers we can do? So we don't care about how many layers. We don't laminate, right? We don't have all the difficulty associated with lamination. This is a, a back in the day when we only had one or two systems up and running. So this had, this is the print head controller board inside the system. Now that we have uh, a lot of systems out there and a lot of systems sold, right? Then it no longer makes sense to build those TCBs internally. And so, right, this is a 12-layer board. In a couple of slides, I'll show you a 20-layer board. Uh, so layers are um, not really of importance. I saw somebody typing a question. Yeah, the question is, uh, do ground plane layers take more time? Yes, perfect question. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to the TI board. So, and it's kind of a cool thing. It's, it's a, with all TI test boards, it, it, you see a massive ground plane. So yes, a printing conductive material takes longer than printing dielectric material. Explanation is, right, dielectric material, 2.5 microns at a time, conductive material, 0.35 microns at a time. So to achieve the same volume, we need about 11 times more time to achieve the same volume. So yes, they do take more time. When we talk about printing time, usually we'd say about 18, 18 hours to about 40 hours. And the main difference there is what's the difference or what's the uh, composition of conductive material versus dielectric material. If you do extensive ground planing, then it will take longer. Uh, if you don't, it will take less time. Great question. Okay, so how do we achieve impedance is something that we teach you. Uh, we don't have enough time to cover this, but essentially it's, it's the same as the fab house does, right? The material has properties X and Y and Z, and if you want to build the impedance, there's an equation. Usually uh, a ballpark beginning is about 25% thicker on the controlled impedance trace than you would do in a conventional uh, fab house. And immediately after that, I say you design the board as if it's going to be manufactured by a fab house. The translation to being built additively happens here on this, uh, on our software, right? So the design that you do, right, always design by your standard fab house rules, right? This ensures that once you print it and everything works, you transition the design to a fab house or, you know, larger volume production and it will work. So all the translations from subtractive to additive happen in our system, not on your design. Your design stays the same. If you wanted to, we'll talk about when you don't want to. Okay, in terms of speed or what you could do or things like that, so an expectation of, of what you should build in your head, about 24, you know, whatever time it takes you to design, I can't help you there, but design to print to assembly, about 48 hours, maybe 72, depending on the process. We don't care what tool you use, snapshot from SolidWorks PCB, but this could be an Altium, this could be a Cadence, this could be Mentographic, this could be KiCad, right? We don't care. And expectations, so to put it in a different perspective, the minimum, even if you design the most complex boards, at least you'll be able to go through one iteration a week, bare minimum, right? Most customers do at least two with one system, right? So if you have multiple projects and you line up the schedule correctly, everyone is going to get at least one or two uh, iterations a week on their designs. Uh, the cool thing about this picture, you can see, so this is for those of us that design maybe consumer products. This is a, a Qualcomm system on module that's off the shelf, right? This is a Qualcomm test board. And then uh, a 3D printed carrier board that's, that's the development piece. 
So both technologies work together, right? If you have, you know, this previous generation platform that you're trying to upgrade, you want to do some interposer boards or add something off the shelf or add something from an older project, right? You can, you can mix and match. They both assemble. They work well together. Doesn't exclude any technology uh, from being used. So some more cool stuff. Um, let's talk about we've done with the printing, right? What do we do? And the, the short answer is everything you're used to doing already you could still do. So if you want to do manual assembly, if you want to do automated assembly, you could go right ahead. Automated assembly would be slightly different, uh, mostly in the temperature ranges uh, and slightly uh, slower cooling ramp down um, to ensure the material stays flat and stable. Those are things will work with you. Um, as part of evaluating, right, or evaluating or adopting the technology. As I said, things are slightly different, so uh, require slightly different assembly process. But at the end of the day, once we work with you and, and make sure you're all trained and experienced, this becomes a, a second nature, like you know how to assemble everything else. Um, Anything, any test equipment, bed of nails, x-ray, AOI, right, whatever you guys have or your favorite vendor has, all compatible, all works great. Um, the board on the middle is actually interesting because you can see it's, it's very different color from the one on the right. And the reason for that, that board in the middle, was, and you can see a lot of epoxy on it, has uh, gone through extensive temperature cycling and extensive uh, shaker table testing. So exactly, right, the reasons why we want something built, tested fast, that's what we give you. So summarize all of this. Everything you know how to do, you'll still know how to do, slightly different. Okay, we spent about, what, 30, 32 minutes talking about PCBs, which PCBs are great, but I want to talk about things that are a little different. So at this point, if you remember, I had a little, little comment that if you don't want to make something that the fab house, right, that can be made mass produced, right, don't, can't be made conventionally, this is where you can start looking at things that uh, maybe some patents, maybe some novelty work, maybe some future products, things like that. So some of the things we're going to show here cannot be made by anything else other than this technology. Okay, so before you throw rocks at me and stones and everything, yes, this is a SolidWorks image and this is an electrical tool, but it does work, right? We can't give uh, mechanical devices, we can't give them electrical meaning. So, yes, there is a nano dimension plugged into SolidWorks. You can see it, if I get my mouse, you can see it, there's a little ND emblem here. So yes, we can start designing, you know, coils, inductors, things like that, maybe brackets with, uh, with some connecting pads, which we'll talk about. Really interesting things. We can start to look into those. We can use those. And they now become very simple. If there's any mechanical engineers on, uh, on the line here, I usually ask the question, how long do you think this will take you to do? And the answer varies from, you know, a low number of hours to maybe a day, and then you can make one. This is a 1,600-turn uh, electromagnet, by the way, very dense. Uh, if you've been to SolidWorks World or you've seen us on a trade show, we usually have a couple of these on display. They're very cool. And by the way, this particular piece started its life as a hard drive motor coil. Um, the hole here is where the ball bearing goes, and then you assemble the motor on it. Very cool. Uh, since then, we modified this design, uh, but the hole stayed, so it's kind of a cool story. Things that we evaluate for production. So maybe, so this particular one is a medical device. Uh, by the coiled antenna, those of you that are in the medical field, you already know what this measures. Um, those of us that don't uh, or are not in the medical field, this uh, measures things related to your heart. 
Uh, and so this is a fully integrated encapsulated kind of device. It's very small. You can see it here. Um, those types of things we are evaluating mass producing or, you know, as a main production source for several companies. Uh, by the way, the interesting piece uh, for this is a battery goes here and it's uh, once it's fully assembled, it's fully covered and encapsulated. And if you're a medical company that uses a lithium battery, one thing you want to make sure that that battery doesn't catch fire. And one way to prevent that is to exclude uh, access to oxygen. So if the battery is fully encapsulated in whatever that is, the likelihood of such a bad event for them reduces significantly. That's one of the things that's driving this uh, idea here. So continuing, more cool stuff. So we all, all of us here, 100% uh, when we go to sleep, we hate passive capacitors or we hate passive components in general. So we want to start removing passive components from being a physical component, right? So we want to start printing those as we go along. The benefits are, are enormous, right, from space saving to MTBF to being uh, supply chain issues, all of those things, right, that, that there's so many problems associated with passive components these days. So very much interesting. The board on the left is actually a printed capacitor board. This is essentially a glorified timer with uh, you plug in what time uh, constant you want, and you can see these are capacitors. They're large value capacitors uh, printed, oops, sorry, all inside and to make sure that we explain that they're inside, right, we made a trace on top of them with room for more physical components. So very, very interesting to begin with. This is being driven uh, or main interest is companies that are in government and defense type work, right, they'd like uh, things to be very robust and very long-term sustained. From semiconductors, right, these companies that actually make passive components, they'd like to uh, make sure they understand this technology and know how to use it so they could potentially sell you virtual, virtual components, right, when you don't need to buy them as a actual component now. And a lot of, a lot of uh, novelty and R&D work, right, universities are doing research on this and things like that. So capacitors just the beginning, right? We're going to do resistors, we're going to do inductors, uh, all of those. Uh, our, our goal to have on display kind of soon is a test board that has a switching power supply that on the board you have just the main IC that does the power supply and none of the passive components are assembled. Don't need any of those. They're all going to be inside. So we're going to have a board with just one IC or maybe two if it's got the switching uh, FET on it or things like that, but no passive components on the board. Okay, some more things that we're uh, looking into. And by the way, uh, we're, we're coming up on, uh, on the end, just a couple more slides. So here, by the way, I'm going to start by telling you that none of the components that you see, none of them are on the surface. All of them are inside the layers. And to further that point, right, when we go to school for engineering, we know there's a top assembly for components and there's a bottom assembly for components and nobody talks about any other option. So there you go. And by the way, we didn't put components on the top or on the bottom because then it would ruin this Kodak moment, right? It would ruin the picture because you won't be able to see anything. But all of these are covered internally and none of them are on the surface. Where we're going with everything, right, what we want to try to do a, a flexible material and we want to do things that are flexible, we want to start removing connectors, we want to start removing harnesses, we want to start looking at reducing the number of electronic components, right, we want to make everything more integrated, everything more seamless, right, so the picture on the left on the bottom, that's what we want to start by showing that you can print multiple boards connected together. Uh, there was a question that I didn't have a chance to read. What was the question? 
they're asking what the flex life of the silver material. If you can do oh. a bunch of cycles on it, or perfect. So the reason why this is in the futuristic and not now is because right now you can get about half a dozen bend cycles, and then the silver would say, "Nope, I'm no longer interested in being a conductive trace. I will just be a disconnected line." Our polymer does know that it's uh, it's being bent and it doesn't care, but the silver. Uh, at this point, is is more brittle and doesn't like to be bent, so that's why it's under futuristic. If it's a bend to fit type application, right? I needed I need this radius, and I'm going to assemble it. Then you can consider this. But as we work on new materials that will be introduced, right? We want to get this into a Kapton like uh, behavior. That was a great question. By the way, if anybody here is in the realm of uh, adding electronics to glasses, then this slide is very interesting for you, and you know where this is going. I'll leave it at that. Uh, there was another question. It's, uh, yeah, is there any density control over the conductive inks or the dielectric material? There's no density control yet. It's, it's something that we're working on to achieve with software. Uh, there's no density control yet. Right now, the control you have is thickness, which uh, is not density per se, but when you look at the grand picture, uh, it allows you to achieve most of what you want when you tweak density, if you change the thickness. But that is coming, just not now. The way to achieve embedding components, yes. The, so the design-wise is a little different. Instead of designing a, a package layout, you design inverted, right? You design a cavity. And then you start to print when the packages, when the uh, cavities are exposed. Yes, you do interrupt the print. You hit pause. You place the components, uh, pads facing up, and then you resume, right? And, that's, and then it becomes a self-assembly type process because as we deposit liquid conductor material, it attaches itself to the pads, right? It does self-soldering. And at the end, it's all covered up and assembled. And if you designed your cavities, uh, accurately enough, then it would work perfect. You can see that if you haven't designed, designed it uh, perfectly, then uh, if it's very dense packaging, you can get a little spray like this, and if it's very dense, it would not work, right? So if we're doing, if we're considering something like this, you don't want to do it with a 1500 ball BGA uh, package, you want to do it with some, starting with the larger packages, so you get practice and you get a, um, a sense of how accurate you need to be. Great question. So antenna RF design carries a, a significant amount of risk. It's the one that has the most pushback from engineering to products to right internally uh, management in a given company just because it's so difficult to test, it's so difficult to design, it has a lot of risk. So when we started out, we actually didn't think we want to be anything to do with RF just because of those factors. But one of our very, very, very early adopters at Harris uh, said, you know, we're, we're very much interested in RF. PCBs are great, but let's do something uh, different. So a lot, amongst the many different things, and we have a lot of different publications with Harris, as you can see, and on top of that, there's a lot of different things that they do internally that we can't share. Um, but we decided, let's do something that, that all of us can relate to. And so we decided to do this exercise. This is, if you ever can't fall asleep, you can Google this phrase, uh, UWB antennas uh, using ultra wideband balloon. You'll get the IEEE document, about 127 pages. By the 10th page, you're fast asleep, I promise you. But this is the main technology used for all commercial drone antennas. You know, all the, the drones that are on sale now, this is the core technology of the antenna, both for the video section and the telemetry section of it. So it's kind of cool. Everybody can, can really understand and visualize. So we said, let's design an antenna. Then Harris, go make one conventionally, however you'd like, and then we'll make one using our technology, and then we'll test them out and see what the differences are. And so this antenna is actually meant to work at 2.4 gigs, and you can see the green line, which is the performance of the printed antenna, and the red dotted line is the baseline for the conventional made, and they actually converge right where they need to be. So really cool. What this allowed us to do, and not us because we don't design products, but enable people that are interested in this 
So there are consumer electronic companies that do initial FCC uh, testing for their products using both printed RF circuitry and printed entire electronics. So that is the type of cool things that we see from consumer electronics side of view. People that are on uh, aerospace, satellite type, we do a lot of waveguides, we do a lot of very, very high frequency type designs for RF, uh, very cool stuff. I think we have uh, one or two more slides. Okay, so this kind of slide to me is, is about, uh, you know, the things we don't think about when we design products. So the top picture, the strain gauge, this is one of those you know, we just tested, we built a product or we designed a product, we have it now. Now we need to spend a lot of time doing testing, especially if you're in the rugged type environment uh, or rugged type industry world. How do we get data? How do we know what we're testing? Is real life is going to work? Maybe how do we get the data out of our product? So when we do shaker table and all these lab types of testing, it's very easy to put sensors in the device and get, you know, cables out or get data out. But when we do actual field testing, and we always do field testing, it's very hard to get data out of the device. And so these types of mechanical things that we can put in the device, and you can see this is essentially a little bracket, it's very small, that has one conductive trace in it. And the idea behind this conductive trace is that an impact or a force applied to this uh, bracket would either permanently change the resistance value or intermittently change the resistance value. And if we design this in a way that we want, if we have this internally connected to a simple GPIO, right, just to measure current, we can actually log real time what happens at what time during the test. And if we can't measure it real time, right, the permanent impact would, or the permanent change in resistance would be logged, right, would stay with the bracket because it used to be one ohm, now it's four and a half ohms or whatever the numbers are, and we can extrapolate the force that this uh, sub was subjected to. It's kind of like, uh, to me, it's, it's, you know, we designed this product, it's great, it's tested, it's approved, and then, okay, we didn't design the packaging, right? We forgot to design the packaging. So these are types of things that we sometimes as, as board designers, as product designers, we don't really think about it but it still gets done, right? We still, all of us spend time in the lab. We all of us sometimes spend time out in the field doing some testing. So these are things that can bring a lot of value because they're so simple and we can now do them in-house and we can customize, right? This will bolt on or fit into our enclosure whatever way we want it to. Obviously things that are mechanically, right, and have electrical shape, right, like this uh, thermometer uh, with a, socket for the uh, LCD and electronics in it. This is a picture of a bracket that incorporates a harness and some um, a harness and connector and a bracket all in one. So you can see connector one and here's connector two. So uh, very cool stuff. Any questions here? Nanoparticles corrode even faster solid silver. Great. So. Yes, if you print a board and leave it on the shelf uh, and don't do anything with it, it won't corrode, but it will tarnish, kind of like silver jewelry. You'll have to clean it at the end, right? If you keep it sealed, right, then it won't. All, all the types of uh, precautions that we're used to doing with conventional PCBs, you can do here and it will still it will help you. Once a board is assembled, usually we don't see any degradation over, over time. Uh, because the pads are covered with solder and components and everything. So when we talk about the rapid prototype and not end use parts at the moment, right, is because we don't have enough data about the longevity or right what it takes to maintain printed electronics uh, for a significant amount of time. So if we consider this a rapid prototype, right, the whole idea of this is you print something, test it out for the amount of time you need, throw it away, move to the next revision. With the end use applications, right, these, these do require some more uh, evaluation on the end user part of it, right, so we do see data coming in. We do have an end use application at the moment right now with Harris, right, Harris has uh, approved the materials for space, uh, so outgassing and 
right? The, the line that you saw about the resistance shift, all these things are important when you do, uh, when you use things in space. In July, there's going to be a 3D printed uh, system that Harris is going to send to the space station to do testing in space. So a lot of things are starting to come in as an end use application. It just needs time like everything else. That was a great question. Thank you. So venturing out into some more interesting things, right? So wire bonding. I personally, you know, find this fascinating in my design career. I've never done anything with wire bonding. Uh, but you can see from the images, uh, very much doable, both in gold, both in silver. Um, for companies that are in this type of space, come talk to us. This is, uh, this is simpler than, than you'd expect. I guess we can leave it at that. But any questions on wire bonding? So that was us to don't know what wire bonding does when you designed a, a IC, right? It's got a semiconductor heart and then a packaging, usually ceramic type packaging, uh, and the semiconductor heart has to be connected by wire bonding to the packaging. So this is where this comes in to play. If you're not in the realm of, of dissecting ICs, then most likely you're not in this world, uh, but that's where this is mostly being used. So last slide, I want to tell you where we're going, what we're doing, kind of summarize right all the future stuff that we've done. So in terms of materials, we want to add a wider range of mechanical properties, right, uh, rigid and flex and in between. We want to add more dielectric, a low-end application, a higher-end application. We want to add more integrated assembly options with the system, right, because we are looking at mass producing. Our biggest customer, by the way, is TTM, which is the, uh, what, third largest PCB house in the world, right? So we're very much into uh, looking into that uh, future. Our second biggest customer is Jable, right, one of the leading full turnkey assembly houses. So we are very much looking into the future and doing mass producing and being a, a fully production technology. And these are the partners that, that help us get there. We want to get a lot more into printing passive components. We want to add digital part libraries, right? Right now you have to, if you want whatever this capacitor is, you have to physically design it. We want to do that for you. Either we want to do that or partners want to do that, right? And they want to do digital part libraries. In terms of the design, all design tools know how to do things plainer, right? It's, it's so annoying. It's 50 years, the same thing, right? So. All of our big partners, right, the, the big three in the EDA world, or should I say the big four in the EDA world, right, we want to talk to them about doing a 3D type design. And to summarize that, uh, pardon my French, why the hell do we need vias, right? 50 years now, why do we need vias? To go between layers, I don't need vias anymore. I can just have the trace go at whatever angle I want to reach whatever layer I want. I actually don't even need layers anymore, but, you know, one battle at a time. So non-planar design on, on the software side, definitely how to simulate um, signal integrity, right, how to simulate those. And lastly, we want to add traceability, right, so when we're talking to the medical, right, they're very important. We want to add traceability to production, right, to embed whatever uh, batch this was. We want to add unique defenses or unique proprietary features that, that customers can design in to prevent being, you know, IP infringement. Uh, we want to add more materials. We want to add print recipes. A print recipe is a set of settings in the system that make it produce whatever it's producing and in a unique way. A recipe is a proprietary IP capability who, of whoever designed the recipe, right? So if I'm, company A and I change the setting in my system and now I can produce something new, that set of settings is now a proprietary uh, capability that I own and we want to make sure that we give the customers an ability to capture this and record it and share it between their, their system, between their sites, between their manufacturing, right, whatever they want. And of course, we want to get into more of, like you said, or the question was about uh, long-term on the shelf behavior, we don't really want that. We want to behave no inventory, right, on the fly type warehouse. This is really being driven 
surprisingly by, you know, Army, Navy, Air Force that really want to take uh, ability to repair uh, damaged equipment on the field, and so they can't bring a full warehouse to the field. That was my last slide. What do you guys think? Yeah, that was good, Ofer. It was uh, very informative. I think everybody here enjoyed it. Anyone else have any last-minute questions they want to throw in? Well, if anybody thinks of anything, they can always uh, hit us up or you know, anyone at CHEI, and we'll be able to hunt down some answers for you. Or uh, you know, email Ofer directly if you want. But thanks, everybody, for coming. And uh, hope we'll come around for uh, some of the more webinars we have in the future. Thank you, everyone, for your time.